another episode, everybody. My name's Emery Wolf. Joining me is Nick Lamb. And this is just Two Camera Guys, a show where we're going to talk all things camera. Um, to start off, I think we need to talk about one big thing real quickly. A lot has happened in the time since our last episode. Um, and yeah, Helena Hutchins. Uh, there's not much that Nick or I could actually say about it. Um, you know, we weren't there. We don't know everything. Um, but the whole ordeal is beyond sad. Um, if you've Googled Helena since then, learned her story about her coming from the Ukraine uh, to the U.S., starting some photography. Uh, she was actually a journalist in, in the Ukraine um, and making it to Hollywood. Like it is, it's, it's unbelievable. The amount of talent, skill, um, the personality someone needs to accomplish all that is you know, it's like, it's, it's like making the NHL. It really is. Um, so yeah, starting off on a bit of a, a sad note. And I know Nick and I have also, we've, we've talked a lot about this in the last few weeks, uh, you know, covering all sorts of areas about it, but, uh, but really it's, it's just a time for us to reflect and, and remember Helena, maybe remember her work. I know I've watched Arch Enemy, which is a, a good show on its own how it is um another one on my list actually which i didn't even know she did was the mad hatter i still i have that on my netflix list so i'll be watching that eventually here as well um but yeah it is a sad day in our industry for that and uh yeah our hearts go out to helena and her family um nick moving on from that uh going into you guys have been busy with leroy and leroy what have you guys been up to lately yeah um just got back from toronto actually we filmed the toronto area kitchener niagara falls hamilton so moving off the prairies is is are we running out of things to do in the prairies <laughs> no that's not that um we'd always set i don't know like that had always kind of been the plan for a long time was to basically start in moose jaw and then kind of tour around to some smaller towns around there and then kind of keep spreading the circle out so yeah for sure so what's that like taking Leroy and Leroy uh, I'm assuming you flew out there which would cause its yeah. own problems and stuff so like what's that what's that like how did that differ for you guys this time around well the gear yeah it's kind of makes you think about gear all over again um so because I'm uh, a little thrifty some would say so I wanted to get everything into my carry-on so I've got one of those hard shell Pelican, you know, those, I should, I should have had it ready here, but it's the flight case. Um, so I, but I wanted to get not just my camera gear in there, but my clothes. So <laughs> I put my clothes. Have you ever used those packers, those packing cubes? I do. Yep. Uh, yeah, they're amazing. So I had my clothes in like one little section and then um, brought my 16 to 35 lens to eight. And then my 24 to 105 lens, um, two sets of wireless mics. So I brought a backup wireless because I didn't want to be stranded without a wireless and backup wireless, you know, the actual microphone itself and the little drone, little Mavic mini two. And what else, you know, just the batteries, that kind of stuff. But then my trick that I used was to just carry my C200 as my personal item. So I had my gear inside the case and then the C200 as the personal item. And then the old- That's, uh, that's the idea though, right? It's kind of like your purse. It's everything all in one little bag. Yeah. Yeah. It's everything right there. And it worked out great. So we did all of that. And then the other Leroy uh, just went ahead and checked a bag and spent the money on it. <laughs> So I did all of that and I could have thrown some gear in his stuff. Yeah. You know, it's, we've had talks before about gear and, and specifically too, like where you, you always get kind of fed up where like people are like, well, it's not about gear, which is kind of, it's a half truth and half, not a truth. Um, do, you, do you think you can elaborate on that? Yeah. Well, yeah. So I do appreciate the, 
um what is it not the not the actual statement but the oh, my, my thing's unplugged here. the sentiment behind people saying gear doesn't matter because it really you could have all the gear in the world and it, the gear won't make the thing good but yeah i think you do need certain types of gear like you need something specific for what you're trying to accomplish would you agree with that yeah like i i think like i said i i I personally too would believe it as a half truth as well so if if you're going to do things professionally you should probably have some professional lenses um you know the there's that uh, 50 millimeter uh, Canon lens that's it's like a $600 lens or something that everybody like rants and raves about. But when you compare that to the 50 millimeter, you know, one that's $2,000, it's, it's a night and day difference, especially mm-hmm. on, on a better body as well too. Um, so yeah, gear does matter. Now, does that mean you need to have a fancy roto light in the background of your shot? <laughs> no. Right. Like it, <laughs> No, you don't. Yeah, you just you just probably need some light, right? That's um, a good one. Or or you Did need I, like is the my color temperature off on that. It's nah, really good enough. The other thing you really you kind of need, Nick, like using for an example, you said you took your twenty four to one hundred five. Um, that's an F four lens. It's not the it's most F4, expensive. Yeah. It's not no, the it's most the expensive. Um, it is a when it comes to video, a workhorse lens if i was shooting documentaries i would 100 percent that lens all the time um just because you've got the range in your zoom mm-hmm. f4 kind of it this sounds really shady but helps you out with your focus as well um yeah. the well, the lens I, itself is I just sharp a lot now <laughs> <laughs> yeah right i like, do but it really is and it and it can take you from wide to telephoto it's an absolute workhorse of a lens and if people are doing like video and focusing on video and run and gun stuff Mm -hmm. that would be the lens i would tell someone i wouldn't tell them to get a 50 mil i'd tell them to get that lens if yeah you have to be doing something that has some some kind of depth to it to just use that lens like you said like a documentary or something that's got some humor in it or something where the visuals aren't standing a hundred percent on its own, because I wouldn't want to use that lens if I'm just capturing B-roll. Yeah. It's, it's, I would want to have warfare. a second lens with me. It's, it's a gorilla yeah. lens, right? Like, and that's why you'd want it. And then, yeah, would you have probably, if I was doing a, do- honestly too, actually, if I was doing a documentary, I would probably like that lens. And then an 85, uh, 1.4 yeah. or something, or what's Canon's even their cheaper one would be a good option as well. Well, I think that Canon's goes to what they've got the 1.8 and then the 1.2, if I remember correctly. Yeah. So yeah, whatever it is, but that one would be your interview one, right? So you'd have your run and gun shoot mm-hmm. stuff that's happening 24 to 105, your interview one to make things look nice, the 85. Or I mean, if people want to use the 50 that we mentioned earlier, right? Um, so I left my 85 at home. Didn't even brand. Well, because it's not useful for what you guys are doing, right? No. No, it's, um, I think it could be, there's a scenario where if we were shooting more of a TV series style thing that we would want to get one angle on that 85 and then the one on the 16 to 35 or something like that. But, right. But I think this goes to that point. Gear matters as long as you're using it for what you actually need to use it mm-hmm. for. Yeah. I didn't bring a single light with me. And now there was a scenario where I could have used the light. I shot something um uh the canon if so i was shooting it at f800 or not f800 iso 800 f800 <laughs> that's an interesting f-stop <laughs> it's pin pinhole i had i had depth of field to infinity <laughs> <laughs> everything was in focus um but yeah it gets a little noisy but i couldn't have brought enough lights anyway to make a difference so uh yeah i would have had to rent lights there for it like here's another thing which just sounds stupid all the time too and this is why flashlights they fix everything for me (laughs) yeah actually that's a good idea i could have just got something else um yeah 
yeah, yeah. you're in a little different world though where you can kind of paint with your light a little bit differently yeah um, um i need continuous light again though your gear matters you need to buy the right gear for your application so again my application uh with landscape stuff flashlights cures 99 percent of my lighting problems when i'm out there um i mm -hmm. used to have i actually i used to i still have flashes for them but i don't use them because flashlights cure all my problems um same too talking about lenses so right now i've got my 24 that is on here and mm -hmm. a 70 to 200 that's it and that can get me 99% of things I want. It's very rare that I'm out somewhere now. And I'm like, oh man, I wish it just doesn't happen now. I don't need a fancy 50 millimeter and 85, right? I don't need these things. So gear matters to a point. So there was a time when I used to think that I needed all the gear. Like I just had it in my head that it was one of those things that it's like, boy, if I, once I get my, gimbal then that's when i'll really start shooting or uh once i get that slider going that's when it's really gonna take off and then i had what did i want to get at one time i had my eye on like one of those underwater housing things i wanted to get one of those i thought that was gonna make a huge difference um i wanted to get a magnet thing for my car actually i got one well spoiler alert that's for a future segment some other time um but yeah, there's so many silly pieces of gear that you kind of think you need, but you really, the scenarios are so specific for them that, yeah, they're sure. an underwater housing is great if you're shooting underwater, but it's just not like I had a plan to shoot anything underwater. Yeah. Right. You're not doing that, you know, on every single shoot you do, you're, you're not shooting water sports. No. <laughs> so and it just, the... it just doesn't pay off. Yeah, and the car mount stuff, like I just end up using my little, I've got one of those little suction things and I end up throwing my, uh, believe it or not, I end up throwing my 1DC on it oh. and then just stabilizing it out. Although now I'd probably throw that, maybe the DJI action cam or something on there and let its stabilization do its thing. I've, I've got the same thing. And yeah, I started just using my GoPro and everything. Yeah. Because yeah, there's no... I, the difference it's just not a lot of the stuff's just not worth the hassle and once you kind of learn the tools i found you can kind of make up for it with being able to apply that piece of gear properly or making it do something else so yeah. this is kind of so this is a different scenario but i read something about uh you know how it's like you'll see you'll need to solve like a minor problem in your house for example like a coat rack uh you go to the store a coat rack's like 40 bucks but there's a certain satisfaction if you can just figure out something yourself <laughs> like make almost like make your own with what you have around your house for free for sure um it, do you know what nick last thing i'm gonna say about this uh before we move on here but um it also limiting yourself also makes you more creative with things. yes um so like we talked a bit about it before that I'm using this 24 millimeter lens and that's all I had for a year and a half. And you made that comment, like I've seen your work, it hasn't been suffering. And I was like, I was like <laughs> yeah. yeah, actually like some, I've had some of the best photos I had in the last year when yeah. I was just using that lens. So you sort of, you figure out how to work with those things and uh, you figure your way around problems. And, and that's really what creativity is. It's, it's that office thing where he goes into the interview. Uh, all right. So uh, uh, what are your weaknesses? He's like, I try too hard. <laughs> I care too much. And I, and I just put in way too much effort or something like that. They're like, so what are your strengths? <laughs> my strengths are my weaknesses. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. Perfect, Nick. Um I think maybe now we should jump into our next segment, which is our guest joining yes. us today. But I'm going to let you introduce her, Nick, because oh, she's is... your relative. Yes. So Courtney is our next guest, and she is Janice's cousin. So I think that makes her my cousin 
I think maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so she's been a photographer for um, the last 10 years where she does photos professionally. She's kind of done the whole thing. She's done weddings. She's done portraits. Um, she's doing what's it called? The the new thing Life, now lifestyle photography yes lifestyle which, which is kind of cool yeah it would be good to chat with her about that um and then she's also got a new job which relates to photography and video where she is um i'm assuming it's i don't know what the position is called but she's organizing all the content for her church now where she's um getting all the video production out and photos and everything like that so yeah that yeah, with, with COVID, cool. I, I think we've seen a lot of that, a lot of uptake in the the responsibility for folks like us and folks like Courtney. Which is um, hilarious. We were actually thinking we should talk with somebody who's doing that with a, a church or another organization that's had to kind of move online. And um, here we go. The other thing, too, I was just going to point out about Courtney is she is located out in Abbotsford, BC, which is kind of nice for us to get out of our, our prairie dwellings once in a while. Yes. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, let's bring her on. Hello. Hi. Hey, Courtney. Hi. Right on. Are you all right if we just roll right into it? I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> so how have you been? Good. Very busy. Yep. Yeah. Good. Yeah, That's good. Got, I got lots to do. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like you've been uh, uh, working for the church full time pretty much then. Yeah, yeah, I was hired to do, I'm the head of their media department, so I do all the video, and I do photography, and I run their social media as well, so yeah, it's super fun, I love it, it's it's a lot of work, but it's great. Yeah. Oh, wow, so how much photography for your other business are you doing at the moment? Not a whole lot right now, because it's just not time. <laughs> Like this, this month I did four sessions. Um, oh, wow. But that's, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. When you're working full time, four sessions on top of that is it, it's enough. But like, that's usually how the fall kind of goes anyways. And like, I don't really have anything else booked, but I don't advertise right now. And I'm totally okay with that. Um, so we'll see. Sometimes I'll get someone calling me last minute, but like, I'm, I'm okay with not doing my own business at this point. Yeah. Do you, do you actually advertise then for it or no. is it all just social media? It's all just social media. Yeah. Word of mouth. Um, a lot of my clients now are just people that I've had over the years that they just keep coming back. Um, and that's, I mean, that's why I don't advertise because I don't really see the need at this point. It keeps me busy enough. Yeah, that's something I always find interesting about like photographers having uh, repeat clients. So uh, to explain this, why I think it's interesting is because I consider myself more of a landscape person. Yeah, so I don't really have like repeat clients and I don't <laughs> understand like coming back for photography all the time. So I, yeah. like, how does that happen? Is it just because people like you or like? Yeah, I mean, that's hopefully that that's the, the idea is that they like you once for you know, you, maybe you do their, their uh, wedding and they like you. And then you do their, when their baby's born and their family, and you just kind of are locked in for life for, for some cases. Um, but uh, yeah, mostly what I do now is, well, a everything that I do now is family. I don't do weddings anymore. I used to do them um, before I had kids, but I got out of it because it was, it's just, it's a long day. It's 12 hours sometimes being on your feet. And when you have two small kids, um, it's, it's a lot to schedule. And then even the editing afterwards, you come home with like, you know, 2000 pictures that you have to work through from, from the wedding day. So it, it was a lot. And I mean, I don't know how much Nick has shared with you, but like my daughter had a lot of health problems. And so I remember being like in the hospital with her and getting a phone call from someone being like, I want to fly you out to Mexico to do a destination wedding. And I was like, huh, like, I got to make a decision here. I can't be flying out to do a destination wedding when I have this little baby that's sick. So I, that was the point when I was like, okay, we need to just stick local. We need to do small sessions. And that's, that's when I 
put it out there that I was done with weddings. And it's kind of, at the end of the day, it was better for me anyway, because I, I don't really enjoy the, the wedding scene a lot. Like, I feel like it's kind of like, there's a lot of, it's not super real in a lot of ways. Like it's so much that's just put on. Right. And I didn't enjoy that very much. Yeah. I think you could probably join our, our group of distaste for weddings. Nick and I have both (laughs) talked about it before. Um, going into your photography too, um, you do lifestyle photography. Can you kind of explain what that is? Yeah. Well, I mean, what I love to do is I, I love to just hang out with families um, and just like photograph a couple hours of the day in the life of uh, what, what they look like at that time. Um, There is, I feel like there's a time and a place for, you know, the, the posed stuff that's, you know, all smiling and matching. Some people like that kind of thing. Um, but for me, and I think because I'm a photographer and I'm never the one that's in the pictures, I feel like what I would like to see is like the moments from my family, right? Like I just want to want to see pictures of, um, you know, (laughs) pictures of, of like me and my kids interacting and stuff like that. And, and just those little moments that make up real life. And that's something that I really, I'm really passionate about documenting just the things that seem mundane to you that like at the end of the day, like are actually so much more important than just the posed pictures. Yeah. Is there, is there kind of like a mindset you got to put yourself in to do that? I, I always tell my clients before I do a session, like it, it might feel awkward at first because like, I'm not telling you what to do. I just kind of walk in and I just say, okay, we're just going to hang out. And, you know, I might every now and then give some sort of instruction, like, you know, move your head this way, or like, well, I'll put them in a place that's good light or something like that. But a lot of it is just like watching, just people watching, which is what I love to do anyways. (laughs) It's just two hours of me and Emery sitting on the couch watching TV. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Nick, maybe just take the remote control. Put yeah. it away. Yeah. Um, do you do you do any other sort of photography stuff to keep inspired? Like, do you do some landscape stuff or some street photography as well? Um, right now, it's just like if I'm not working, it's it's stuff with my kids, um, which is kind of the same. Like, it's it's like. Mm same sort of stuff as what I do professionally, but it's just with my own kids. Um, oh, nice. Good. Yeah. That's, I found that's a big problem is that I never, I shouldn't say never, but I rarely take photos at home. It's weird. Yeah. That's good that you do. Yeah. Do you find taking photos of your kids sort of re-energizes you to go back out? Oh yeah. And I find that like something that I've learned a lot with, um, with photographing my own kids is because like you're taking pictures in any lighting in any situation so you kind of have to force yourself to to really like be prepared for anything right like when I do professional stuff you pick the time and the location so you're like oh well we're going to do golden hour and it's going to be at this beautiful park or something like that and you have a lot of control, but with my kids, it's like they're outside in the backyard at two o'clock in the afternoon with full sun on them. And I mean, it doesn't look pretty, but you kind of have to force yourself to be like, well, how can I make this look interesting and, you know, make it work when it's not ideal situation. So yeah, I I really like that. And I, I like, I mean, with my own kids, I know, obviously I know them really well, so I know how to capture their personality. And it's, it's always really fun when you kind of get those those uh glimmers of their their uh personality in the pictures so you kind of hinted at it before but it sounds like it takes a little bit of work to get people going with this or or how do you convince people that lifestyle photography is is the way to go for them um you just kind of have to show them right like just i i'll show you know that my portfolio and and a lot of the people that uh, come to me are familiar with a lot of my personal work too, just through my Instagram account. Um, 
And yeah, you just kind of have to, they just, you just have to tell them like, you, you need to trust me that this is gonna like, if I come into your house, it may not, you may not think that it looks perfect and you know, it doesn't look like an Instagram house or something like that. But I mean, that's my job is to make anything look nice. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. The, uh, we, we actually, we had an episode all on social media, whether social media is ruining entertainment. Um, it, are a lot of people like, is that the expectation now is that you're making like the Instagram house? Yeah, I think I feel like there's a lot of people that, you know, when they hire me, they say, oh, we don't want to shoot in our house because it doesn't it's not like all white and, you know, pristine. And I'm like, I don't care. Like, do you want your house to be all white and like that? Like, I mean, you want to remember your house and your family as you are, not like as some pretend family. Yeah, that's a weird uh weird scenario I never thought of like and and yeah. too, just because like I'm not into it and I don't do it so yeah um so with that said too I think this sort of basically like when I've done photos of people as well I guess what I've done I'm gonna call it lifestyle it wasn't really lifestyle but um I would just set up like a scenario of some things to happen and shoot it and that was about it um why do you think this style is sort of gaining popularity with people? Well, we we photograph so much of our lives, even with our phones and stuff. And I think that there is something to be said for having those real moments captured in a professional sort of way. Um, even something like like births, for example, like I had mentioned that I had, I've done one birth before and that's sort of a genre that's starting to catch on now it's still not like not everyone is super into it but I mean it used to be like maybe at a birth the dad took a couple pictures but like there wasn't really anything taken right and then like as for me like after I had my kids if there was no pictures I don't remember what happened like (laughs) and it's so like I actually I did have a good friend of mine who's a birth photographer was there for both my births and it was just so amazing like then having these pictures and being like wow like I don't really remember that happening but like it having this memory even for my kids to like look back and be like this is the day I was born like how crazy is that that there's these this story like someone documented this day um it's such a cool thing to have and you're talking about story and actually just thinking about how you put your, your clients coming back and you're, you're kind of almost creating this life story of people. Mm -hmm. That's kind of, it's incredible. Like thinking about it now, I never actually thought about it until now, but is that maybe sort of the aim as well or. Yeah. Yeah. It is like, it's, it's really fun. I'm some clients that I just did last weekend. um, I've been photographing them since their oldest was like two, I think. Um, And now she's 10. And it's just so cool seeing like she's, she's this little preteen kid and, and kind of sassy. And it's just, it's so fun seeing her grow from this like little, little toddler to this preteen. And uh, yeah, it's just knowing that like I have, and like, even when I've been in their house and then I see like, there's all my pictures up on their walls and it's just, it's such a, it's a really cool thing. And it's like, I feel honored that you get to be part of that story getting kind of like granular about it too. And and I, I always feel like this is a complicated question to answer, but in, in a single image, is there something you do specifically or that you're thinking about to sort of craft that story for that time uh, being, being that it is the lifestyle of it. And it's, it's all about that sort of time and that moment. Um, how, how do you capture that story? What do you do? What are you thinking? Uh, you just kind of have to look for the connections Um, one of the things, even when I'm like trying to just capture like the group family shots, when people ask for like, we just want, you know, a couple shots in the session of, of like everyone together. One of the things that I do, and it sounds super dorky, but I'll just say, okay, we're going to just kind of squish together. And I want you guys to look at each other and laugh. And like, it's such an awkward thing. To like turn to the person next to you and force a laugh. But at that moment, it's this awkward moment. And then like 
then they start laughing, like actually laughing and having these like moments of connection that like, otherwise they're kind of hard to force, but you like put this, give them this awkward moment to, to try and work through. Then you like can see those, those connections. Um, That's yeah. brilliant that you just should <laughs> say that just, Hey, just look at each other and laugh. That's yeah. really clever. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, it is good. That's like the entire story of Nick and I, our relationship together. <laughs> Just aw- awkward situations. And I end up laughing at Nick and he laughs at me. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so I was going through um, your portfolio too, which by the way, like your website, all the photos, it's stunning stuff. It's good stuff. Yeah, it's um, amazing. One thing I kept noticing. I'll edit a bunch in. <laughs> yeah. The one thing I kept Henry noticing. Henry does all the editing, so. <laughs> Nick Nick does nothing. I don't know if you've ever worked with Nick, but he literally does. He comes up with a million ideas, doesn't write anything down. It's awful. Oh. Um, yeah. Anyways, I, I was looking at all the photos and for some reason, I just, every time I looked at it, like I, I was questioning, like, are, are you sure she's not from Saskatchewan? Like, is she actually out in BC? Like there's no mountains, there's no nothing. Uh, there seemed to be like, you know, some farmland trees and all this other stuff in the backgrounds. And yeah, it's a very just, prairie I, feel like a cool prairie feel. It's got a definitely a, yeah. uh, feel to it, you know? Yeah. So what, what is it about your photography that, that does that? Or why do you think that's maybe happening or, or is well, it, I us? mean, it could be, it could just be, uh, I think I know which sessions you were maybe thinking about. There's there's a, a couple locations that I like to go to that have like big wide open spaces um, that people really seem to be attracted to because um, you can get like lots of big sky in them and uh, people like that. But as far as like really mountainous sort of uh, locations to go here, it, it you'd have to actually drive a bit to really show off the mountains. I mean, I can, I can take pictures of the mountains, but if I'm doing family stuff, it's not easy to really include them, the mountains in the background where we are. That kind of makes sense. Is, is there maybe something too like universal about it? Like I'm, I'm scrolling through uh, on your website right now too. And you know, like the, there's some city shots here on a boardwalk and the cities in the background. Like I, honestly that could be Regina for all I know I feel like there's something universal about about photography and and I'm just not sure what that is all the time well I think that there's just like certain aesthetics that like that are appealing um you know we gravitate I I specifically like to gravitate towards um symmetry and lines and stuff and I think that that's appealing for a lot of people um that's and even like with the a pullback shot, right? Like the wide open big sky. People like to see lots of clouds and stuff like that. And um that's just kind of it's universally appealing. Nick's gonna love this question because I always tell him not to talk about gear, but uh the the lens and, and stuff you're using for this. What's what's your kind of setup you use for this? Cause I'm I'm assuming bef- I should set this up for first before the show kind of nick and i were talking about uh gear and how Mm -hmm. gear is it isn't important but it is important and what i think really matters is whether you have the right gear to pull off the task um so i guess that's what i'm getting at what is the right gear what do you use to actually do this type of this style of photography uh well i like to keep it really simple um generally I am shooting with just the 35 mil. I find that I can, that gives me a lot of freedom to like, I can do a, a nice far back shot. I can get nice and close. Like I always tell, tell my clients, like, it's going to feel like I'm super close to you, but like, I'm not up your nostrils. Like, don't worry <laughs> about that. <laughs> but I love, I love the look of the 35 because it feels so natural. Um, it doesn't, it, it does a good job of just really capturing what the eye, like exactly how the eye is, is seeing. Um, I recently started using the, uh, it's a 70 to 200, um, the, the Canon 70 to 200, 2.8, I think. Um, 
and that's it's a beautiful lens um and uh but it's huge and i i took it to a session this weekend and oh my goodness i was tired because i carried i had two cameras and i because i hate switching lenses so i just carried both my cameras with me and oh i was tired after that carrying that <laughs> huge lens with me wow. the whole time <laughs> but uh, it's funny that I, Nick, would you have guessed a 35 mil? No, no, neither, that's, neither would that's I, amazing that sense. you can make all of that happen with that lens. That's really cool. Part of that is, is just like practicality. Like when I first started, we just didn't have the money to invest in a big setup, right? Like I was, I was doing this, this was my only job. So I mean, as far as investing into a business, I was like, well, I mean, if I can make it work with one lens and one body, then, then that's great. And after a while, you're like, you know what? I, I like what I'm doing with one lens and one body. Why do I need to do a whole lot more? That's um, so funny. That's so, because so Amory for the last year and a half, he basically just had one lens. What is it your 28 mil or something like that? Uh, 24, yeah. 24 yeah, like mil, yeah. 24 and he was like he was talking about how he wanted to get another lens and all of this but it's the same kind of thing with you where i told him i was like well your stuff's looking really good yeah I, I, do you really need another lens like it yeah. seems to be seems to be working out pretty good for you plus it it kind of puts you in positions where you're almost getting more creative for it you're not oh just, i know yeah yeah, you don't just reach for another lens and you have to kind of think and go, okay, how can I make this work mm -hmm. to get this shot? Yeah. I'm just thinking too of the nature of, of the the style of photography you're doing. Like basically you're becoming, you know, the adopted child of this family. Yeah. So so naturally you're going to be close. So a little wider yeah. lens makes a lot more sense. Well, yeah, it, it definitely allows for a lot more connection with between me and my clients. Um, yeah, I actually had another lens that was one of my most favorite lenses. It was a 16 to 35 um, is such, such a beautiful lens. And we were when we were traveling across Canada, I dropped my camera and it broke off of the camera. So it's just the mount that broke. And now there it sits in my cupboard and I'm like, I need to send it away to get it fixed. And it just like, it's probably oh, no. a, not even an expensive fix, but it's just sitting there and it just kills me because it was such a great lens, super oh. fun. Like, especially when you had it like really at like 16, getting like nice and close, kind of had a bit of a fish eye, but not like crazy distorted fish eye. But yeah, it was a really fun lens. <laughs> I use that lens all the time. It's on my camera right now yeah <laughs> it's it's actually that's the funny part too talking about my 24 so that one's the the lens i want to get in in my package and i'll probably end up keeping this one for astro or or getting rid of it after i do get that lens so it seems to be actually it seems to be a lens that absolutely everyone wants yeah yeah it worked well for me um so just going back into to the lifestyle photography thing again. So if you could make a recommendation to someone starting out or trying to do this stuff, what what would your advice to them be? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I guess you just have to have, you, you have to kind of get used to being like, I think as photographers, we feel like we have to be like in charge of the situation and like directing people. Um, but you have to kind of be okay with being a fly on the wall and, and like telling your clients that like, I'm, I'm just going to be here and, and it's not going to be, it might feel uncomfortable for you, but like, you have to be okay with just being in the situation. And sometimes, I mean, I'm talking with my clients and stuff and I'm, you know, interacting with them, but, uh, yeah, I'd say just just be confident in in your eye and watching the moments because that's the biggest thing is just like really paying attention to the connections with with your clients. Yeah, uh, what's kind of interesting about that too, Nick, is that probably goes back to the comment about how gear doesn't matter. Not nothing yeah. she talked about was like gear or anything. Yeah, that kind of reminds me a little bit about getting 
b-roll from live events and stuff like that where you're just kind of sitting there watching because yeah you could just go run around and film a whole bunch of stuff but you kind of have to sit back and watch and observe and figure out what you need to get and yeah i'm assuming it sounds it sounds a little bit similar anyway yeah is, oh, can- sure. is candid stuff always better uh yeah i love candid stuff yeah like i i i love the just when even when i'm picking the pictures at the end of a session like when i'm calling things i i tend to gravitate towards like the the quirkier stuff right the stuff where maybe they're not making like that perfect smile but it's kind of like the scrunchy faces and stuff like that like that's what i i like because that's that's how we really are like we're not we're not normally just like perfect smiles all the time right we're making funny faces at each other and that's that's what i like to choose for my clients Nick, how do you feel about candid stuff all the time? Well, I think for that application, it's really good now, but I don't know what it, but for some reason, I always, I don't know if it's just that I can't help myself, but in even at live events, I'll like tell somebody, all right, carry this and walk over here. And I, I don't know. I just find, I think I'd have a hard time just being quiet and not telling somebody what to do in that situation. <laughs> See, that's the advantage of being an introverted person uh photographer is i'm totally okay (laughs) with just like hanging out in the background (laughs) yeah i actually it's funny too when i was shooting weddings that was my approach i'm like like you guys shouldn't even really know i'm there yeah and and i've actually had it too like people come up to me at the end of the night like oh you're leaving we we didn't see you around here like i got the job done don't worry (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah um Going back to something you said at the start, uh, or I guess we kind of talked about at the start, was uh, you're currently working full time yeah. at a church. Um, you have two children. How do you balance everything? <laughs> I, I imagine you're quite a busy lady. It's challenging. Uh, the The job at the church has has been new since COVID, um, so my kids are getting used to me being in an office. And not being always available at every moment. Um, they're in kindergarten and grade three at this point. So they are capable of being independent. Um, we try to, you know, make sure that they have places to go and, and things to do while I'm working. But generally, I try to keep most of my working hours when they're at school. Yeah, we just kind of fumble around and try and <laughs> try and make it work the best we can. And especially now, like like it's just I feel like I have to take this work um just for for myself um just it it just feels so fulfilling to be able to do something creative um especially for the church like it really I I love being able to provide really quality media for them, which is like, this is a really new thing for our church. We had no media department before this. Um, So it was like when, when COVID hit and (laughs) the first day that we had to do an online service, um, my husband, who's the, he's the music pastor at our church. He came home and he said, we're going to, we're going to film the service on our iPhones. And I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> it's like, you realize that I'm capable of doing this. Um, <laughs> and so I just started like, started with volunteering and it just like went from like a, you know, couple hours a week to a full-time job. Um, and uh, yeah, I just feel really fortunate that I'm able to provide that for them. And so I, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be able to have a job that's a creative job that's like stable because that's one of the things as a creative person that like when I had my own business you'd have these seasons where you're like you know you're working constantly and then all of a sudden it's winter time and you know nobody wants family pictures or no one's getting married in December um except if you're Nick was it December when you guys got December, married? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was for the photographers that needed work is why we did it. Yeah, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's I, I'm really grateful to have a creative job that is that's a stable creative job. It's it's incredible. I'm just thinking about like like that creative personality and 
and like it seems like you always need these outside influences or, or do you think that's important that you need an outside influence to or you need that change of pace all the time um yeah I definitely like when I am not doing just like creative stuff just for the fun of it I definitely notice that like I I feel a little bit kind of down and and like especially now like in this last, the last two months have been really, really busy just at work. And like, it's, it's creative, but it's not, it's like very like, you know, routine We're we're doing stuff in a studio. Um, and, uh, I've, I've noticed that like, I haven't done anything just, just for fun. And I, I really noticed that I, I, feel like I, I need to pick up my camera and just like, I mean, yesterday with Halloween, I grabbed my camera and I was like, quick kids, like get outside and let's just do something fun. Um, which was the first time I think I had taken just fun pictures of my kids for like a month, which maybe for other people is, is not that crazy. But for me, I mean, I take like, we have, we have photo books of our kids that are like 250 pages of, <laughs> of oh, wow. photos so like there's a lot of pictures yeah. do, do you do something else then to to sort of compensate for that as well or does that make sense or, or do you do something oh. else to sort of inspire you oh well I'm a I'm a musician so I do a lot of I do a lot of um music outside that's kind of my other creative outlet um I pre-COVID I used to perform a lot I had a jazz band and I used to sing in a vocal ensemble um now it's just like try, trying to find opportunities to play music. And that's definitely my other creative outlet. Um, yeah, you yeah. did a video. I would, it feels like it wasn't too long ago where it was just you singing in a studio, I think. Yeah, actually, really it, was, good. it was here in my office. Um, oh, was it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, there was at, at one point in, during COVID, I was like, I'm just so... I'm just so bored with like, I have no music that I can play. And um, I had recently, we had gotten logic um, and I was learning how to mix audio for the church. And um, because I was, we were recording all the music for church services. And so I, that's something I had to learn. Um, so I was figuring out logic and I was like, I really just, I, I need to do some of my own music. And so I just started recording some songs that we had done with my jazz band a couple of years back. Um, so I think I did like four, four or five videos that I stuck up on YouTube to just to entertain other people. And yeah. Oh, that was great. Yeah. yeah. Is, is there something about music and imagery that like just goes together? I'm, I'm laughing at myself saying this, thinking about like <laughs> movies and what we're currently doing. So I feel like clearly there is um but just as far as that like inspirational stuff like because I, I imagine music sort of gets you inspired gets you into it and then once you're rolling you know it gets you moving on photography st stuff as well oh totally like there's a lot of times even when like I mean I've put together a lot of like video for for our family and for other people and stuff and even now with with the church we'll we'll do like video trailers for stuff like that and it's so important picking the right music. Like it, it can change the video, like complete opposite directions, depending on what kind of music you pick. It's, it's a so, huge thing. Yeah. This is kind of the, uh, uh, I know this question gets asked a lot, but do you pick the music first when you're editing or do you cut the video together and then go back and pick the music? Uh, well, it depends on what, I mean, if the music is the main focus, then then the music is is first but uh a lot of times i mean for for uh what i'm doing with the church the music is picked afterwards um and you just kind of have to sit and scroll through a lot of music and just whatever feels right yeah what about like for photography itself like are you you know when you do a session do you have like a little mini speaker with you and have some music to set the tone or or when you're editing are you listening to music uh I'm not really list I don't really listen to music a lot when I'm when I'm editing um no not really <laughs> interesting I, I I just yeah. I'm fascinated by it because yeah. like I'm I'm very like musically 
driven. Like we joke about it. So I do a Facebook page with another lady. She's like, I want to say she's like 65, maybe. Um, anyways, it's so we'll go- <laughs> yeah. she'll just be happy. I didn't call her old. Um, <laughs> but yeah, she'll, we'll go on these trips driving across Saskatchewan and like, you know, we'll be talking and things will be fine. And then, you know, all of a sudden like a pretty amped up, like Metallica song will come on. I'll be like, yeah. And she just laughs, laughs at me and stuff. So we've made a few comments. Actually, she was asking me about gangster rap one day and she wrote a whole story about listening to NWA and stuff in the car and, and Metallica all at the same time. And that's how we made our, our trip through Saskatchewan. So for myself, there's always kind of been this like music connection with mm-hmm. it. So I guess I was just curious if someone else was that way as well. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think I I definitely feel like really inspired when I listen to there's certain music that will kind of like, I feel like goes with certain seasons in your life or, or, you know, time of the year, right? Like I tend to listen to a lot of folk music in the summer for whatever reason it feels right. And it, I, I, probably influences kind of how I take pictures in the summer, maybe of my kids or something, maybe they feel a little bit more like fluid and, and, uh, and uh, natural. Um, Just because a lot of times I'm listening to Joan Baez (laughs) in the summertime. Yeah. It's a little different than Metallica. Yeah. A little different. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Actually, it's funny too. We, we did a, uh, we got interviewed on uh, the Saskatchewan Weekender show, and that was when she was asking us on on there. Shauna Powers was asking us about music in the car and stuff like that. And Su- Susan listens to like opera music, like like deep into an opera library, yeah. and like I just refused to listen to it. And Su- Susan was trying to tell like this difference between musics and and stuff, and I just like leaned into the thing. I'm like death metal. We always <laughs> listen to death metal. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think that now it's just become a joke. Oh, um, I'm all over the place with music. I'm like, <laughs> I I grew up listening to a lot of like heavy metal stuff, but I mean, I'm, I always like jazz is kind of my big thing. Uh, um, but I love opera as well. And, and folk music, I'm like literally in every camp. <laughs> Cool. Um, well, yeah, I think with that said, uh, we can sort of just wrap this up. Uh, thank you for coming on, Courtney. Yeah, thank uh, you. Thank you. Yeah, Great yeah. chatting with you. Yeah, this was fun. For sure. And Nick will see you at the next family reunion or something sometime. Yeah. He'll, he'll, he'll <laughs> have to say, he'll have to say hi to your second kid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, before we let you go, Courtney, actually, one thing I think we forgot to get you to say is uh, where can people find you? Where can they learn oh, more yes. about uh, the work you're doing? Oh, well, I guess on, uh, on my website, just CourtneyRada.com. Um, it, uh, you probably have noticed it hasn't been updated recently. <laughs> I think the last one was maybe last winter, but I'll be throwing up some new stuff soon. Cause I've got a bunch of sessions that I'm working on right now. But uh, yeah, if that's where they want to find my work. Um, other than that, that's uh, most of my work is for our church right now with, uh, with Ross Road Church in Abbotsford, um, just doing their video. But uh, yeah. Perfect. I think that's all. That's, that's awesome. It. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks again, Courtney. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank Great you seeing having- you. It was good seeing you too. Well, Nick, another great interview uh, with yes. Courtney there. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, happy, yes, oh. happy to have her on. Happy uh, you dragged her out of the woods for us, Nick. <laughs> um, moving on, we we kind of hinted at before, but we have a bit of a new section. Our last section we had was a total bust, but I think this one's a <laughs> oh, little this bit is a better. Good one. Yeah, and and we're this calling it the shelf of shame. <laughs> it's that part of your shelf or space with your camera gear where you buy something with fabulous intentions something that you think you need it actually ties into our previous talk uh, but you never really use it or you use it once and then it just wasn't what you thought it was going to be or um, it's just sitting there and you haven't sold it yet or got rid of it 
Yeah, basically, it's a colossal waste of money. Yeah. And we all do it. <laughs> not not even get a candy coat. Yeah, we all do it. Yeah, we're gonna have to get an audio uh, eventually. We could do some kind of splitter for this, <laughs> where we film like just like boxed gear that's never had the wrapping taken off of it. Yeah, we got we really got to work on the shame. sponsorship thing. Yeah, exactly. Right, like who wouldn't want to sponsor that? Yeah, the shelf of shame. <laughs> we should get like Kijiji or something. Is Kijiji still a thing to sponsor? Oh, I love Kijiji. Yeah, is it well, still Kijiji, a thing? Yeah, they're owned by eBay. eBay owns oh. Kijiji. Um, it's like a friendlier version of Facebook buy and sell. There you go. Yeah, Didn't no, I'll know it still put existed. stuff on Kijiji. I bought the treadmill off Kijiji. Oh, worst decision ever. <laughs> it's um, awesome. I'm, I'm loving it. <laughs> have you, you seriously have you used it? Yeah, yeah. Like uh, not guess, for exercise, but like to just to see what it'll be like when I do start exercising on like it. Like you, like you just set house plants on it. No, I got on it. And I ran. I did. Uh, the timer said three minutes. Um, Living large. I run. saw how fast <laughs> it would go. I cranked it up to full speed, and Ruth was yelling, "Get off! That's too dangerous." The beacon of health. Every camera guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I did, oh, did three minutes. So getting into it, Nick, yeah, what is sitting on your shelf of shame on, today? So today on my shelf of shame is this onboard microphone. Um, it's got a little, I think it's decoration. It's got a little on off switch on it, but it's, <laughs> it goes into your uh, shoe and it just plugs in. And I thought, boy, this thing is going to be great because I'll be able to capture ambient sound. That's not my internal mic. And it, I used it once and I just never remember to put it on. What, what kind is it there? I'm, I see it's a uh, the side, Asden, I which is classic, classic uh, microphone manufacturer. It, I think that's the problem is that it's in between. So it's too cheap to actually use to get any kind of backup dialogue or anything like that um but it's slightly better than the onboard mic but it and you, and you didn't even use it for like run and gun stuff well i always forget so like i could put it on for run and gun stuff <laughs> so what what did you use i i don't know i maybe put it on once for something um but <laughs> i i just don't really have a use for it right now like what the sound that i'm gonna get off this just isn't good enough to make a difference so yeah, it was one of those in-between gear things that it's just not good enough to use, but it it's slightly better than the onboard mic. So yeah, like I'd have to look up what it was. I feel like it was 60 or 70 bucks or something, but yeah, yeah. total waste. You know, I uh I kind of hope someone like blasts you for it on like the comments or something. Yeah. Because like you. it does seem like even me, I'm thinking like it does seem useful. Oh, it does. And it would be good, but it's like You'd have to, I, I feel like you'd want to spend three, four, 500 bucks, get something decent, get something with proper shock mount that's not going to rattle, not going to do the same thing. Um, okay. So something more like the road. Uh, yeah. Video, or maybe like a couple hundred bucks, something. you know, spend, spend the, the extra money to get something decent that'll yeah. do a good job that, yeah. Cause this doesn't even have any shock mount. So you bump the camera, it's, you're hearing it um but oh, yeah wow. no i i get that it would be good but um yeah i just never use it don't really see the point probably won't ever use it again should probably just sell it yeah um so speaking of which my item for the shelf of shame i actually am trying to currently sell um and it's actually pretty new to me and pretty new on the market This is the nomadic peter mckinnon uh cube pack i guess they call it it's the one it uh it's got a little two zipper system here the one one opens up to the inside probably didn't hear that because i was covering the mic and the other one opens up into an expandable oh nice day pack backpack thing if you unravel the whole thing um 
so basically I bought the Peter McKinnon bag. Yes. Um, cause I was pretty sure that was a good idea for me. That was a solid purchase for myself. Uh, just so when I go on trips, I can pack my clothes and everything mm-hmm. I have, I can basically throw on it for a weekend. This was like a hundred and fifty or hundred and sixty dollar add on. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah, and it Ooh. fits like perfectly in the top of the backpack. And I thought I was gonna use it to like store things, but then it just like it didn't fit like the the little knick knacky things I needed to fit up there real well. So I ended up just like throwing all that stuff in my bag on its own, anyways, or in yeah. the like little pre bag things they come with um i also thought it was going to be like a good idea like say i traveled to on a vacation to you know europe or something and i thought this was going to as be you do good... every summer yeah right because uh, i'm a camera <laughs> guy and i'm made of that kind of money yeah <laughs> so yeah. so anyways winters I, in I thought bermuda it... <laughs> summers in switzerland <laughs> yeah right um So I thought it would be a good idea for like, you know, throw it into your luggage, load it up with camera gear, throw it into the luggage, take it along with you. And then if you go out on like a little day excursion, you could unravel the backpack and stuff it with clothes and stuff and go in. But like, there's two problems. One, I think the amount of times I would actually use it would be so low. And two, the size. This would be sweet in Rome that I could I can yeah, picture I this back in Rome. Yeah. The the second thing I think is wrong with it is like it's for my camera and gear, the size is just a little bit off. So uh just for an example, the the total like circumference of the 70 to 200 um f2.8 lens is a lot larger than say the f4 lenses, right? So if you have a smaller camera, say like a Canon RP or a Sony six thousand six hundred series can't remember what they six thousand um with the the smaller cheaper lenses would work great in here but a bigger camera with bigger lenses just it it's uncomfortable it's awkward in there it's hard to get stuff in there um the other thing i was mentioning this to you before actually was that i think it would be a really good uh bag if you were heavy into drone stuff um i'm not too sure if like the fpv thing would fit in there i'm sure there'd be a way uh the mavic mini for sure would fit into there so if, again you're out traveling somewhere you want a quick light bag for that it would be a good thing for that and i am currently selling it on facebook marketplace because i'm I lazy f- and that's all i do <laughs> i feel like um the purchase would have to be a camera person because the purchase for a drone i can't see it's just not gonna be worth the dollars but yeah right like i to me seeing this as like a drone and throwing it into your own bag type thing so it just keeps your drone separate from everything else that would make more sense to me yeah i guess if you if somebody bought it used off of you for a deal then that could work but yeah so here's the question for you what is actually on the shelf of shame the bag myself or peter mckinnon (laughs) (laughs) Um, that's a funny one yeah obviously Um, yeah that's good (laughs) (laughs) yeah anyways nick um i think that's probably good enough for the show today uh we should get things wrapped up here um i hope people enjoyed the new segment i think we'll keep bringing it back yeah i got so much junk here and you know what we should do now that i'm thinking about it um we'll have to start uh listing stuff eventually you don't list anything what do you mean I know you mean like selling it, but just in general, you don't write yeah. anything down. Typically not, but um, I'm good. You know what's okay? I can't wrap my head around this, Amory. Um, there's certain, L- I'm, I think I'm good at compartmentalizing because I could prepare for a show very, very well. Yeah, but you, when you do that, you're getting paid for it. <laughs> yeah. So you're, you're pretty incentive. I'm good at doing my do job, it, right? Like, <laughs> I can well, do my job. Yeah, right. Like when you're getting paid for it, like, yeah, sure. I'll plan everything out to the ninth degree. When I'm not, no. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Why why would we? I mean, like I said, we do have a Google Doc. We do occasionally yeah. write things down, but
but uh i tried to follow along work. for a bit today did you notice that follow along what with the script we had a script well the doc that you the questions that you had listed out because <laughs> i was thinking about asking one of them and then it was out of order and i was like ah skip it emory's got a plan <laughs> Oh, it's funny. I do. I do actually wish that you you would talk more. Seems seems how you are related to her. Yeah. No, I can start talking more. Yeah. Well, especially in that situation, you just like kick me out of the way, take over. Yeah. I was just enough. doing it because I I don't like awkward silences. Oh. I, I get uncomfortable. Fair. Yeah. <laughs> I can see that. I don't mind. I think I'm just slightly awkward, so I don't mind awkward silences as much. You're. You're good with just basking in awkward silence. It's, they're not as awkward for me. <laughs> that, doesn't bother right, that, me. Was, <laughs> that was like as far as I could take That's the awkwardness. As as I take just it. started laughing at it. Um, <laughs> all right. On on that, uh, you know, just gem of a, <laughs> yeah. of a note. That, that is what people stick to the end of this show to hear is awkward silence. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's just wrap things up. Uh, call it a night. And uh, yeah, thanks for joining us, everybody. And have a great day. Charge your batteries and keep your... Um, still, you're still... You're your tripod try level. <laughs> <laughs>